Easter celebrates life, but for many Korean families, the deaths of loved ones in a ferry accident clouds this year's celebration. The Vatican plays a role in crisis talks addressing the unrest in Venezuela. We have an expert discussing those talks tonight. Losing his leg in a farming accident may have saved this marathoner's life in Boston last year. He's back with company to finish what he started. I'm Susie Pinto here in Rome celebrating Easter Monday. I'll have an update for you on the upcoming canonization of John Paul II and John XXIII. Stay tuned. Those stories and much more just ahead on EWTN News Nightly for Monday, April 21st, 2014. A somber Easter service for Christians in South Korea this weekend. Friends and family members mourn the victims of the recent ferry disaster. Good evening, I'm Brian Patrick. We begin tonight with news now as rescue crews continue to work to find and identify the victims of that ferry that sank last week. At this point, 87 are confirmed dead and more than 200 are still missing. A transcript released this weekend shows confusion about evacuation just before the ferry began to tilt. Meanwhile, families of the missing prayed for their loved ones on Easter Sunday. Some of those family members have provided DNA samples to military personnel to help identify the victims. There were more than 450 people on board the ferry when it suddenly tilted and sank on Wednesday morning. Today, negotiators from the Venezuelan government and the opposition are meeting to delve into their country's political and economic crisis. Protests in the streets continued over Easter weekend. Thousands of opposition supporters marched through Caracas Sunday as student protesters burned effigies of President Nicolas Maduro and government officials. The effigy symbolized the burning of Judas, an Easter Sunday tradition that is also an expression of public discontent. Dr. Juan Jose Dabu, former managing director of the World Bank, joins us to talk about the Vatican's role in these talks and what we can expect from these negotiations. It's good to have you back with us. Do you see a potential for these two sides to compromise? How do you see these talks? Society in Venezuela is extremely polarized. Uh, things that started on February the 12th this year have only been in crescendo in terms of uh, the violence and the desperation that people are experiencing. So I think that dialogue deserves a chance, but I'm not that optimistic that there will be a resolution out of this first wave of conversations for two reasons. One, the main actors, the students, are not sitting in the table. And two, some of the people from the opposition will not sit on the table until and unless there is a, a real commitment from the government, which can only come if the government actually frees the political prisoners and gives amnesty to them. Otherwise, the rules of the game for a fruitful dialogue are not present. It's heavily weighted under the side of government. Could it be a first step, though, towards something more substantive? Well, I, I always give dialogue an opportunity, and therefore I would say it is a step. Uh, whether it's going to produce the results that we all want, I don't think so, at least not in the short term, but it is a step in the right direction, and I think it, it is a response primarily, from my perspective, to the uh, effects that the students are having by coming to the streets and openly uh, show their discontent with the government, by also, but also uh, given the uh, very timely intervention of the Catholic Church uh, by expressing very clear views and actually defining what the real situation is. So the Vatican is a sponsor of these crisis talks. What impact do you think the Vatican has in South America? How is the church seen there at this point in history? Well, in general, uh, in Latin America, the church, the Catholic church, is very well respected. Most of us are Catholic, um, and therefore, the participation of the church is welcome. The bishops of Venezuela wrote uh, an official communique that clearly states, and I have a copy of it here, the Episcopal Conference stated that the fundamental cause 
of the current crisis is the government's intention to forcefully implant a totalitarian regime. So the church has been very bold, very outspoken, and of course the Pope himself, Pope Francis, uh, wrote to encourage the parties to reach an agreement. So I think the participation of the church in a situation like this is crucial. Very briefly, what do you see as the worst possible outcome and the best possible outcome of this whole crisis? The worst possible outcome is, of course, no uh, agreement on anything whatsoever, and therefore what we saw happening this weekend will continue with more people dying, with more people being unable to work or find food and basic needs being met. In the most hopeful scenario, the government will agree to release the political prisoners and give amnesty to those who uh, have participated in what in other countries is a common expression uh, in a democratic uh, society. So um, we'll see in the next few days uh, which way it goes. But I think, again, that uh, what the bishops of Venezuela have expressed defines very clearly what is the magnitude and the depth of the problems that Venezuela is currently going through. Dr. Dabu, you provide a great insight into this, and we appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. The number of teenage girls reportedly abducted from a Nigerian school is now believed to be more than 230. That number is from the girls' parents, who told the state governor today that education officials would not listen to them when originally estimating the number of missing students. Chabak Government Girls' School in northeastern Nigeria was attacked last week by extremists from the terrorist group Boko Haram. Parents and neighbors are searching for the girls in a bordering forest, which is a known hideout for the militants. Most of the young women are between the ages of 16 and 18. A California teen is lucky to be alive after spending five and a half hours in the wheel well of a plane as that jet traveled across the Pacific to Hawaii. The 16-year-old boy apparently is okay tonight. After hopping a fence to get to Hawaiian Airlines Flight 45 on Sunday, he spent most of the flight unconscious in freezing temperatures with very little oxygen. When the plane finally landed in Maui, the boy climbed down and began wandering around the airport. He was found by airport personnel. He has since been released to Child Protective Services and at this point has not been charged with a crime. Nearly 36,000 runners set out from the Boston Marathon starting line today in a show of support one year after a bombing turned their race into a scene of carnage. This year, race organizers raised the limit on the number of runners, allowing almost 10,000 more to participate. They also made room for friends and relatives of the victims of the bombing last year. Last year, two pressure cooker bombs went off near the finish line, killing three people and injuring more than 250. As a result of last year's explosions, almost 5,000 runners were not able to finish the marathon. One of them, Jeff Glassbrenner, returned today to finish what he started, inspiring others like him. A single moment can change lives. Jeff Glassbrenner knows it can change everything. My bucket list was definitely the Boston Marathon. In 2013, Glassbrenner ran the race. At mile 25.9, twin bombs killed three people and injured scores more. 33 years earlier, an accident changed his life. In Boston, it saved it. I stepped in a pothole, and so I opened up a sore in my leg, and so I had to take my leg off to, to kind of check it out. He had lost his right leg in a farming accident. Adjusting his prosthesis kept him from the finish line. I know that uh, if I don't go back, that they win, and I'm not going to let a couple of bad guys, you know, steal my finish line. A year on, he's ready to finish what he started, and he has company. Chris Madison and Andre Slay. It's no way I could have dreamt of anything, anything to this magnitude uh, in my whole entire life. Slay lost his right leg in a motorcycle accident. He had never run a race, forget a marathon. Neither had Madison. He lost his right leg in a boating accident. Both were heavier, then a chance encounter. I'm 39 years old. This whole pursuit of the Boston Marathon that's a goal in itself, but it's given me so many opportunities to experience things that I hadn't got to experience since I was 10 years old. They spent the past year pushing themselves and each other to new limits. They got new legs. They put in hundreds of hours of sweat, glass Brenner at their side every step of the way. It's been an amazing journey, kind of mentoring them and coaching them to get them to the start line, because the start line is all about those guys, but the finish line is all about me.
A journey of three strangers, so different yet. You look at us and you see the smiles on our face. You see the hard work that went into it, but that day is gonna be amazing, especially when we cross that finish line all together at the same time. A special bond forged by second chances, that chance to claim victory. What an inspirational trio, God bless them. This is the holiest time of year, Easter, and today Pope Francis blessed the faithful for the Easter season. The Holy Father led the traditional Regina Celi prayer for Easter Monday. That prayer replaces the regular Angelus during the Easter season. From the window of the Apostolic Palace, Francis blessed thousands of pilgrims. He told them to exchange Easter blessings all week long as if it were one single day and urged them to spend Easter in joy and serenity. For millions of Christians around the world, Easter is a time of great ceremony. We get a taste of the celebration tonight from our Jason Calvi, who is at the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception here in D.C. Happy Easter, Jason. Brian, happy Easter to you. You know, the Pope's ambassador to the United States had his Easter vigil mass here. Just one of the many ways Christians are honoring the resurrection of Christ. Let's take a look now at some of the unique ways Christians kicked off their Easter celebrations. A tomb becomes home to a great celebration. It's Easter, the place where Jesus rose from the dead. The light conquers the darkness here at Christianity's holiest shrine, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem. As the main reason for joy, Christ is risen. Indeed, he's risen. Eastern Orthodox believers say the flame inside the tomb is miraculously lit. They call it the Holy Fire. It's passed from person to person and then taken to other cities, including Bethlehem's Church of the Nativity. And Catholics in Bethlehem celebrate here at St. Catherine's Church. The Catholic Patriarch of Jerusalem celebrated Easter Mass inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And take a look at this. Two Orthodox parishes in northern Greece shoot rockets at the other parish. The winning village is the one who hits the neighbor's church the most. I've been making rockets for many years, but this time we did not make many, perhaps due to the financial crisis. It is one of the most beautiful traditions of Greece, but a bit dangerous. When we are careful, there are no problems. Well, we don't have those rocket competitions with our churches here in the United States, but if we did, this would be a great place to have one of those rocket competitions. The height here would, would give us great advantage. But uh, what we do have, Brian, to celebrate is tens of thousands of new Catholics that come into the church at the Easter Vigil. Uh, here in the Archdiocese of Washington, they say it's one of the largest numbers ever. It's the largest number ever, actually. 1,300 new Catholics here in Washington, Brian. Well, we celebrate with all of them and all the new Catholics across the world uh, on this Easter Monday. Thank you, Jason. Easter celebrations also found their way online. Our partner Catholic News Agency asked Twitter followers to share their Easter memories with the hashtag CNA Easter. Mary Brooks posted a photo of an Easter vigil celebration. You can see someone being baptized into the Catholic Church. The images weren't just coming from the States. Carlos Junco tweeted out a photo. Here's a picture of his church in Ecuador. And take a look at this. Lauren Cater shared a photo of her favorite Easter eggs this year. Well, this Easter week is especially exciting for our EWTN News Nightly team. We travel to Rome to cover Sunday's canonizations of John Paul II and John XXIII. A group of us leave tomorrow afternoon, but our producer Susie Pinto is already in Rome tonight, and she joins us now with a preview. Susie? Brian, happy Easter from Rome in all its splendor. Italians are still celebrating Easter as the church does. Today is known as Pasquetta, or Little Easter. And according to Italian media reports, 14 million Italians are on vacation. Of course, many tourists and pilgrims came for Easter and are staying for the upcoming historic canonization of John Paul II and John XXIII. And many, many more are expected. Estimates are in the millions. Alan Holdren and the entire EW10 team here in Rome are working hard preparing exclusive coverage. And of course, Brian, you'll be here with us in a couple of days. I can't wait to see you. Great, Susie. Our Rome team is packed and ready, and we'll see you Wednesday morning, Rome time. Coming up, are anti-Semitic leaflets a real threat to Ukrainian Jews, or is it just a way to feed the political unrest there? And a Costa Rican woman credits soon to be St. John Paul II with curing her of a hemorrhaging brain aneurysm.
EWTN News Nightly continues for Easter Monday, April 21st. Hi, I'm Brian Patrick, and Vice President Joe Biden is in Ukraine right now, offering U.S. support to leaders there. He arrived today hoping to help de-escalate tensions between Ukraine and Russia. The Vice President plans to meet tomorrow with government leaders who took over after Ukraine's pro-Russian president was ousted in February. Pro-Russian protesters continue to occupy the government buildings in the eastern region of Ukraine. Western governments accuse Moscow of fueling the unrest and worry about a Russian invasion similar to the incursion into Crimea a few weeks ago. Russia has tens of thousands of troops massed along Ukraine's eastern border. The Ukrainian prime minister says he's going to find and punish the people distributing leaflets ordering Jews in eastern Ukraine to register with pro-Russian separatists. As Wyatt Spencer reports, some claim the leaflets are really just a ploy to stir up more conflict. The chief rabbi in Donetsk, Ukraine, says he is stunned that anti-Semitic leaflets calling for the registration of Jews with authorities were posted in the city. I can say that we are very shocked, shocked by the fact that someone allowed themselves to print and distribute such leaflets. He dismissed claims that the Jewish community was being targeted as part of any anti-government unrest in the country. The leaflets raised the specter of Nazi-era persecution, but a self-appointed official of the organization named on the leaflets said they were fake. Meanwhile, people who live in eastern Ukraine were hopeful that this week's agreement in Geneva between Ukraine and Russia will help bring about a peaceful compromise. We really hope that such meetings will prevent bloodshed here because we don't want blood. We want this issue to be resolved peacefully and for us to be given an opportunity to decide on our future. In an effort to de-escalate tensions, Ukraine's prime minister announced that the government was drafting a law that would offer amnesty to pro-Russia militia members if they lay down their arms and leave government-occupied buildings. However, Ukraine's foreign minister warned protesters that will not comply. If those people are ready to uh, leave the buildings to surrender weapons, uh, Tomorrow, today, tomorrow, so we can encourage OEC mission to negotiate, to mediate and uh, implement this. But uh, um, if uh, uh, this will not start in a few days, I think that uh, do after the Easter, there will be more concrete actions. Pro-Russian occupiers showed no signs of relenting, saying they will only leave when the interim government in Kiev resigns. Wyatt Spencer, EWTN News Nightly. News Nightly contributor Dr. Melissa Muschella joins us now from Catholic University of America. These leaflets that have been circulated, do you think that this is just a way that they're stirring up uh, the tension there, or is there a legitimate threat to the Jewish people living in Ukraine? Well, the leaflets themselves seem clearly to be just a matter of each side trying to get the other to seem to be more anti-Semitic than they actually are. Mm -hmm. But the fact that they can actually do that points to the fact that that's even plausible points to the fact that there is underlying anti-Semitism there, both on the part of Russia and on the part of the Ukrainian Nationalist Party. So there is real concern with regard to anti-Semitism in the Ukraine, but the leaflets are just a political ploy uh, to try to frame the other side as the real anti-Semitic side. How does this fit in, do you think, to the whole idea of international religious freedom, religious liberty in the dis discussion that's going on? Well, there's a real concern about international religious freedom around the world. Religious persecution is really at critical levels throughout the world, probably worse than it has been in a long time, especially in the Middle East, uh, Egypt, Syria, of course, China, there are ongoing concerns. And I think it's a real concern that the U.S. has not stepped up to the plate to be a strong voice on this. Obama has spoken about it. He said all the right words. But nothing has really been done. Even the position of uh, the ambassador for religious freedom has been uh, vacant since the fall, and no move has been made to, uh, to put a replacement there. So while there's a lot of talk, there doesn't seem to be any action to really send the message that this is a priority for the U.S. as it should be. Do you think that's intentional, or do they just not care enough to take the action? Well, who's to say what the intentions are? But it seems to me that the Obama administration of course, they're going to speak as if they care very much about religious freedom because that rhetoric is politically popular and important. But it seems, just based on the way that they deal with religious freedom concerns on the home front, that they don't really have a, an understanding of its importance, you know, considering, for instance, the response to the health and human services, contraception, and, and abortifacient mandate. The fact that they're not really willing to budge at all on this 
despite the fact that there are hundreds of lawsuits now against them from people who are unwilling to leave their faith at the door when they when they enter into the business world. I mean, that tells me that this is not an, an area of priority importance. Yeah, President Obama himself, though, said last week going into Holy Week and Passover that there is no room for the kind of violence that we saw there in Kansas. Do you think anti-Semitism is an issue here in this country, or was that just an isolated case? It seems to me that that was an unfortunate but, uh, but isolated case, although I think we do need to be concerned in this country about religious freedom more broadly, particularly protecting people now in the face of the kind of new orthodoxy with regard to same-sex marriage, where anybody who voices any sort of opposition peacefully and respectfully ends up being fired, um, sued, you know, the wedding photographers who don't want to make a, uh, to photograph a, a same-sex commitment ceremony end up being sued, the wedding cake makers, the t-shirt makers, the counselor who doesn't want to counsel people in a same-sex relationship, all these people are found losing their jobs because they want to be faithful to their belief in marriage as the union of one man and one woman for life. And that's a real threat to religious freedom, among others, that we find in our country. Yeah, it seems a dangerous trend. Dr. Yes. Melissa Mascala, thanks for joining us from CUA. Thank you. We appreciate you. Well, just a week out from Blessed John Paul II's canonization, we have the story tonight of a woman whose life was transformed by a healing that she attributes to the former pope. Three years ago, Floribeth Mora was diagnosed with a brain aneurysm that started to hemorrhage. That changed after she watched the beatification ceremony of John Paul II on TV. She says during the ceremony, she picked up a magazine with the Pope's picture on the front and heard a voice telling her to get up and not to be afraid. Mora said she stood up and instantly felt better. A variety of medical exams showed her aneurysm had disappeared. Vatican officials took it from there. There is a medical commission who examines the situation of this former ill person and if there is no scientific explanation why this person became healthy again, then it is a miracle. Because of her miraculous recovery, Blessed John Paul II's canonization cause moved forward. He will be officially recognized as a saint on Sunday and Mora still receives a steady stream of visitors to her home in Costa Rica. Up next on a beautiful day here in Washington, the first family hosts an Easter egg roll for kids. And gun salutes in London mark the Queen's 88th birthday. You're watching EWTN News Nightly, now five nights a week here on EWTN. Two California companies are developing unmanned watercraft to study the ocean. These ocean drones can stay at sea for months to gather scientific data, patrol borders, and protect endangered reefs. EWTN News Nightly's Mark Irons has the story. They've been flying through the skies for years. Now drones are hitting the high seas. Liquid Robotics has developed an unmanned drone which travels on the ocean surface. Powered by the sun and the waves, the wave glider can stay at sea for months, collecting continuous weather data and other important scientific information. It has the advantage of being right in the ocean, uh, measuring the undersea, the surface, and the above surface all at the same time. Last year, the wave glider broke the Guinness World Record for the longest journey of an unmanned surface vehicle, traveling nonstop from San Francisco to Australia. And so the future is having large numbers of them uh, working together, being able to solve some really tough problems. Another Bay Area company has developed a record-breaking ocean drone. Sail drone set the world distance record for an autonomous boat powered by the wind when it sailed from San Francisco to Hawaii last year. Through no wind and through some very, very strong winds, some 45 knots, um, it did really well, uh, very robust and can survive a long time at sea. In addition to gathering scientific data, the wave glider is also being used to patrol borders and protect endangered reefs, something sail drone sees in its future as well. In the no-catch zones uh, and you know, stopping illegal fishing, so we can be out there with a camera and a radar and reporting back on any vessel that goes through the area. Someday passenger and cargo ships may also be controlled remotely without a captain on board. Mark Irons, EWTN News Nightly. Fascinating story. Thank you, Mark. Well, with Easter comes a classic American tradition here in D.C., the White House Easter Egg Roll. The first family kicked off the annual celebration with the theme, Hop Into Healthy, Swing Into Shape. Today's event including live music, storytelling, and of course, the egg roll race itself.
President Barack Obama read the classic Where the Wild Things Are to the crowd of children. An estimated 30,000 of them participated in today's Easter tradition on the White House South Lawn. Prince William and Duchess Kate are continuing their tour of Australia, and they made a very important stop for Easter yesterday. The royal couple attended an Easter Sunday service at St. Andrew's Anglican Cathedral in Sydney. Before leaving, William and Kate signed the first fleet Bible. That's a King James edition of the Bible that arrived in the Down Under with the first fleet of European settlers. They're not the only royals making news today. Queen Elizabeth is celebrating her 88th birthday. To mark the occasion, two different gun salutes were delivered in London, one at the Tower of London and one in Green Park. Buckingham Palace also released a new portrait of the Queen on her special day. She looks beautiful. Finally tonight, we often hear about bringing our faith to the streets. Well, one group in Texas takes that literally. A North Texas church is going for a world record with a massive chalk drawing of Jesus. Check this out. The portrait is 17,000 square feet. The church and the portrait can be seen from the air by thousands traveling in planes that take off from Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. The chalk drawing was completed just in time for Easter week. Well, tomorrow, Wyatt Spencer anchors News Nightly. I'll be en route to Rome with our team to cover preparations for Sunday's canonizations. Meantime, we encourage you to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. You can always catch us again on EWTN's YouTube page. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick. Thanks for watching. Happy Easter. Good night and God bless you.